to Velina Sok. This episode is dedicated to Turkey and my guest is Dimitar Bechev. He is lecturer at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies and visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe. He's also author of two really good books. I, I can only recommend you both books, one dedicated to a rival power Russia in Southeast Europe and also the most recent one, which is also quite relevant for our episode, Turkey under Erdogan. Now, this podcast episode is possible due to the cooperation with Bharat Vata, one of India's leading podcast producers on politics and society. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dimitar, Bulgarian fellow, Dobredo Show. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to be on the show. Now, Dimitar, as a keen observer of Turkish politics, could you share your personal evaluations of the presidential and the parliamentarian elections? And also, what is your expectation for the upcoming election on the 28th of May? Well, the, the second question is much easier to respond because I think from today's perspective, it's, it's very clear that the third one will carry the day. But he's just one sort of 0.5 percentage point away from the finishing line. And also yesterday, the third candidate, uh, Sinanovan, endorsed Erdogan, which probably will result in to at least some of his voters switching their allegiance and opposition will demobilize as well. So we can safely assume uh, that uh, by the time many listeners will tune in to listen to this podcast, that Erdogan will be there for the third term as, as president. What's my view of the campaign? Well, it's not easy to campaign against somebody who's been in power for such a long time and who managed through various means to structure political life and the state institutions around himself. In a hybrid regime, you're always fighting against the odds. And the opposition probably did the best they could do in the circumstances, although to be fair, there's a lot of blame going around these days after Kalaj uh, the main opposition candidate, underperformed in the first round. The opposition involves a broad spectrum of parties, from sort of political Islamists all the way to the secularists and the Kurdish nationalists informally. It's always difficult to sustain such a broad coalition. There were questions around the choice of candidates, and there were pros and cons with Kalaj but also with potential alternatives. So I think in hindsight, people will be probably a bit more kind to, to this campaign. Right now, we are in the middle of the fight, so to say. The assessment is moving back and forward until the 14th of May. People are giving thumbs up to Kemal Kalashdaro. Now everyone is trying to, or, or at least seeming to discount him and to write him off. Probably through to somewhere in the middle. But uh, yeah, it's not very difficult to guess what the result will be in a couple of days from now. Do you have any expectations for some kind of change in terms of domestic politics before we move actually to the more interesting part, at least from my personal point of view, and that is obviously the regional and global context? I any... don't have any expectations. Maybe a few things to note. I mean, first of all, any government in Turkey is facing a severe economic situation with inflation rampant, and that's not something recent, unlike in other places across the West, for instance. Turkey has a chronic inflation problem. Uh, this puts pressure on governments to come up with policies that can ensure economic growth at the same time, deal with this rapid erosion of living standards. And in this department, Erdogan has failed dramatically, and I don't see why he would readjust after the elections. In fact, it might even get worse because he made lots of promises to the electorate, and that's in part what got him elected, or it's about to get him elected. There will be big time spending, whereas Turkey cannot afford it. So that's something I'm concerned about, turbulence in the Turkish economy, which is pretty sizable in regional terms. One other aspect to pick up on is realignments. Now, Sinan Ogan, as we said, gave his support to Erdogan, and he's, to me, playing a long game. He wants to be the leader of the nationalist bloc, 
and in Turkey, you have all kinds of nationalists. But let's say the far right, the far right nationalist movement, which is now aligned with Erdogan under the Nationalist Action Party. But now, all of who used to be part of this uh, same political force back in the day, I think he wants to dethrone Devlet Bahçeli and eventually emerge as the junior member of this governing coalition. And finally, whatever happens, you have the Kurds uh, who longer term are hard to bypass as, as a block of voters and political party holding the balance. And one, one wild card finally is what happens in the big cities where the opposition managed to make inroads in 2019. It's not unlikely that Erdogan will try to re-establish control with Istanbul and Ankara in particular. Whether he does that through the judiciary by uh, opening all those cases against, especially the mayor of Istanbul, who of course is appealing a, a sentence, or whether he waits, and by here I mean Erdogan waits until a regular election takes place and tries to regain power legitimately, it's, it's an open issue. But I'm definite that he'll be emboldened by the outcome of the election. He'll push against the opposition and try to divide, but also to regain, recapture all the position he lost over the past few years. Erdogan has certainly made some sweeping changes to Turkey's national and regional agenda. Can you shed light on his vision for Turkey within the broader global and regional context? What, in your view, will be the key foreign policy priorities of his administration? What is your expectation? Well, let's say that there is the grand vision and there is the harsh reality on the ground, which was the big theme in the previous decade when Turkey tried to lead forward changes in the Middle East during the Arab awakening, only to encounter stiff resistance from various other parts of the region or other actors and, and, and scale down its ambitions. But I think the vision remains the same. The Turkey is yet another rising pole in a multipolar world. It doesn't belong to the East nor to the West. I know it's a client of China, but somehow it's in the middle and tries to carve out its place into the sun and it's on the rise as well and has shared interests, but also points of friction with all the major players. So that, that's the vision, which is very distinctive, and it's different from what it used to be before with Turkey being part of the West, or, or being trying to make it into the inner realms of the West, which is the EU, less so NATO. That's gone. And it have been gone even in the Kalush Darulu presidency, not just, it's not just about Erdogan, it's a shared view, I think. In the region, which is probably more important because we are down to the nitty gritty, Turkey wants to be a top level player in the Middle East, and in fact it is. I mean, it's very much embedded into this regional context, whereas people before it were somewhat uneasy about being bundled together with the Arabs, with the Iranians, with all those other Muslim majority countries. That's become part of the identity of the governing AKP and Erdogan. The Turkey as an elite and also Erdogan personally have come to terms with the idea that you cannot just emerge as a top dog in this part of the world. You have to share power, you have to be realistic of what you can achieve. And if you look at the past few years, Turkey has been in re-engagement mode. Uh, they re-established relations with Israel, there is a warming of relations with Saudi Arabia, a reset with United Arab Emirates, which is quite remarkable given that they were waging a proxy war in, in Libya not that long ago. And now the big price is what happens with Syria, much closer to home. And this ties in in a way with domestic politics because everyone has been promising to repatriate those 3.9 million Syrian refugees. And Erdogan promised that he will step up those policies. Kalash Darul, the opposition candidate, is also promising it, as we recall. And that was Rogan's main policy item too. But to do that, you have to have some sort of a relationship with the regime in Damascus. And Turkey has come around, partly with the help of Russia and Iran, uh, from a position where Erdogan wanted to replace Bashar al-Assad and to stall a different regime in Syria to trying to establish 
normal diplomatic relations, in addition to the back channel that has always been there, one shape or form. Now, going a bit deeper into the weeds in, in Syria, which again, I think is really important given its place on the map and, and connection to domestic affairs. It will be also difficult to achieve because the regime in Damascus has put forward a shopping list of demands, the uh, main one being a Turkish withdrawal from those enclaves in the north of Syria that are under direct or indirect control of, of Ankara. And I don't think it's feasible because Turkey has established this buffer area for two reasons. One is to have a safe haven for potential refugees from former opposition areas especially in Idlib, we have a huge mass of hundreds of thousands of people living in close quarters. So what happens if Turkey is not there? I mean, how do you make sure that you don't have the refugee pressure? And secondly, probably even more importantly, is the fear of a Kurdish expansion. Starting from 2016, Turkey intervened to make sure that there was no Kurdish statelet in northern Syria run by a militant group that Turkey sees as an offshoot of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK. So you cannot just pull the plug on those commitments and, and those positions Turkey established territorially in northern Syria. Finally, I mean, also population there probably relies on Turkey for development and public services uh, for all practical purposes. Places like al Bab or even the Euphrates, Hilary, Afrin, they are integrated into the Turkish electricity grid. You have Turkish banks, Turkish hospital, Turkish school system operates. So I don't see how Turkey extracts itself in the name of resetting relations with Assad. It will be an interesting process to observe as analysts and, and diplomats and practitioners. With Russia being a significant regional power, its relationship with Turkey is, uh, of course, of great interest. So how do you foresee the Russia-Turkey dynamic evolving if Putin also remains in power after the presidential election next year on March 17? Well, that's another easy prediction, isn't it? <laughs> we can safely assume that, barring something totally unforeseen, kind of, force majeure, if you will, he will be running the affairs of Russia. And frankly, even a full-on defeat in, in Ukraine won't change the state of affairs, I don't believe. So for the next years, it will be the same to man show with Erdogan and Putin. And I don't expect any major shifts in Turkish policy, which will be to be in the middle between the West and Russia. In the short term, we are very likely to see Turkey endorsing Sweden's succession to NATO after the elections, which will be a way of saying that Turkey hasn't broken ties, he hasn't turned into a rogue player. There is this whole conversation between the Biden administration and Ankara around the F-16 fighter jets, and there is a clear tit for tat there, or, or quid pro quo rather. So that, that, that will be swallowed by the Russians because they have no other choice and probably they depend on Turkey as a mediator. But Turkey won't take any anti-Russian position. It will be, as a, a colleague of mine very cleverly put it, it will be pro-Ukraine without being anti-Russia. If it is possible, it will be biding its time. Uh, if conditions are right for negotiation, it will be offering its services. And once the conflict is over, hopefully sooner rather than later, one thing you will see is Turkish construction companies piling into Ukraine to profit from reconstruction. But in the short term, Turkey will be just hiding behind NATO and behind Ukraine, of course, to contain Russia and also playing the role of, of mediator with Erdogan and Putin using this personal relationship. It has been the case since basically February 2022, the invasion beginning. And I don't think that will change anytime soon. Maybe just to pick your brain on an interesting statement, and that is that Russia is seen as the old sick man of Europe in the 21st century, just like the Ottoman Empire was considered the old sick man 
of Europe in the 20th century. Would you agree or would you regard this, you know, effort by Russia for, let's say, for a geopolitical relevance, the, you know, going all in on Ukraine and trying to be geopolitically relevant on the old continent and beyond? So a kind of a final push for geopolitical relevance in this obvious kind of post-imperial construct that Russia has become. What is your take on that? And how is Turkey going to deal with this? I, I don't see a scenario where Russia becomes totally irrelevant. Of course, there's the wild card again. If there's a total collapse akin to what happened in 1917 with the civil war and, and takes a lost decade for Russia to reconstitute itself. But all things being equal, Russia will still be there on the map and it's a large country, it's a nuclear power, it has all those relationships not just in Eurasia but also in the global south. It will be there, maybe in a diminished version. It won't be as influential in Eastern Europe, places like Ukraine obviously and, and even Moldova, because a stalemate, but not just to talk of a defeat, which is a difficult thing to contemplate, but let's say a stalemate on the Ukrainian front would have denied Russia its main goal to annex huge parts of eastern and southern Ukraine and establish a puppet regime in, in Kiev. That's gone now. So Ru Russia will have suffered a major setback. Tomorrow, if Belarus, if Lukashenko is gone for whatever reason, that will be very open, another question. So it's on a back foot in Eastern Europe, but it's not irrelevant in the grand scheme of things because it has staying power. And that's my expectation that Russia will be there uh, under Putin or not Putin. It will try to play whatever hands it has. But as you've written yourself, and I th think there's a bigger question about China and Russia and what Russia's relationship to Beijing is which is the big looming issue going forward. Uh, and I think there are no easy answers because right now Russia is partly because of this ill-advised decision to invade Ukraine, but also longer term has become into this kind of junior partner in a, in a coalition that is growing and shaped according to China's preferences and not according to Russia's mentioned the big geopolitical elephant in the room that is the growing tensions between the United States and China in this kind of scenario let's assume that you know these tensions are going to further deepen how will Turkey position itself I mean being a NATO member but having this very let's say troubled relationship with the United States on the one hand and then again obviously trying to capitalize on the Geo economic expansion of China now brokering all these deals in the Middle East and beyond Central Asia, where Turkey has been also projecting a lot of power. Will Turkey navigate while trying to avoid taking sides, or will it be confronted with a more, let's say, ultimate decision at some point of time in the future? How will Erdogan position Turkey in this game? I think it's safe to assume that he will be neutral. Turkey won't have a dog in this fight and he'll try to maximize his position. He won't be under any pressure to take a stance. I mean, Russia is a neighbor, Turkey is in the Black Sea next to Ukraine. It's a different ballgame. But with China, I don't see a Turkey joining a Western coalition. I mean, it has, historically, funnily enough, it has done so because in the 1950s, during the war in Korea, Turkey was part of the UN peace enforcement operation and took lots of casualties fighting the North Koreans, but also the Chinese along the line of contact. And that was how Turkey made it into NATO. And it was not for, you know, not was a, it was not an act of charity <laughs> that Turkey paid its share back then, but it's, it was back then. It, it, we live in a very different world. Turkey will try to stay to the extent it's possible on good terms with, with everyone. Maybe not the, the US because there will be anti-American rhetoric in the public sphere and there will be more pragmatic behind the scenes. And Turkey will be exposed to Chinese talking points, Chinese propaganda. But in substance, Turkey will be equidistant. By the way, it's very interesting to 
follow how Erdogan's policy evolved on China. Earlier in his tenure as prime minister, especially, he was much bolder. In 2009, he called the, pro the persecution of Muslims, Turkic speaking, Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, and he called it a genocide in 2009. And it's totally inconceivable. Now. He hasn't said a word of what has been going on in this part of China because the relationship to Beijing is much more important than any minority rights or kinship ties to, to communities over there, which is an interesting thing to contemplate. Of course, China has become more important as a funder, as a trade partner for for. Turkey, China helped to extend during earlier iterations of the financial crisis in Turkey with swap lines. So it might be not top of the list of priorities for, for Turkey, but it's pretty much up there as, as well. Especially if we go back to the vision that Turkey is part of the multipolar world of tomorrow and that the US is declining and China is, and others are rising. So yeah, I don't see any reason why Ankara should take a tough line on the Chinese and, and join the fight eagerly. And they'll have a perfect excuse because I don't think many EU members will do so either. So in that respect, we might see Germany and Turkey taking a very similar line on, on the Chinese in the context of confrontation between the US and China. We will stay a little bit at the regional arena before we move to Europe, where I would like you to discuss several interesting topics. Speaking of the Central Asian countries, now we've seen also this show of, you know, of power, regional power with the Central Asian China summit. So China introduced a new format, the five plus one, very similar to what it has been doing in Central and Eastern European domain with the 17 plus one, meanwhile, 14 plus one format. Do you think that Turkey may try also to kind of benefit from this, not just from the geo economic side, because China will be pushing for a lot of geo economic projects. They want to build, for instance, a railway that you know, obviously connects the Central Asian countries to create a, an alternative transport route in the case that, let's say, the one that has been planned via Russia is not going to work in the future. I mean, for whatever reasons. Then we know for a fact that Turkey has been having a lot of cultural influence in the region. Do you think that given the growing Chinese footprint, that there will be a kind of effort on behalf of Turkey to also capitalize on that, you know, to use some kind of animosities? Because we know for a fact that, you know, population in the Central Asian countries is not necessarily very happy with this growing Chinese presence, I mean, economic and uh, with all the accompanying effects, right? What's your take on that? I don't think Turkey can rival China or Russia in Central Asia. It doesn't have the power, it doesn't have the resources. In fact, we sort of, we've been there before because after the end of the Cold War, there was a lot of wishful thinking in Ankara in amongst the people who were dead in charge. First Turgut Tozal and then later on Suleiman Demirel. That Turkey could be the model, the leader of post-Soviet Central Asia. But the actual performance is very underwhelming because, of course, all those leaders subscribe to initiatives championed by Ankara. They welcome Turkish contractors and the rest. But Turkey didn't have the capacity, the strength to, to lead. It was very much in the throes of a succession of crisis by the middle of the 1990s. And Turkey didn't have the boots on the ground to arbitrate in key conflicts. I mean, it was Russia, even though we can Russia that intervened in Tajikistan, which is not a Turkey speaking country as well. Russia policed or provided security for regimes if needed. Be I mean, the most recent example, fast forward to today, is what happened in Kazakhstan two years ago. So, Turkey is a second-rate player in, in Central Asia, and partly because people in our trade very often look from a bird's-eye perspective at, at the region. They looked at the big powers, 
the Turkeys, the Chinas and Russians of this world, but they forgot to take into account the local actors. And those regimes came into existence following long imperial rule by Russia and the Soviet Union. They are not there to have another big brother, whatever the name. So they, they fend for themselves. And that's something that is very clear even to the, to the Russians at this stage. But having said that, there are opportunities and niches, and it's probably a better, more close to your question, because the economy is there, Turkey has what to offer, it has been in the region. It can also benefit from some initiatives China is, is putting forward. The middle corridor, the Turkey champions through the Caucasus and onwards, will be something that also China will enjoy, because it is an alternative. It's first, of course, an alternative to the land route through Russia and Belarus to, to Western Europe, but also to the sea lanes, which is the main way to shift cargo to the main markets in Western Europe and, and, and elsewhere. So Turkey has also potential. The EU is in very much favorable towards this middle corridor. You can look at the Southern Gas Corridor as a subcomponent of this transport corridor as well. And the Southern Gas Corridor bringing Caspian to the EU is something that the US, but also the EU, have been advocating for over many, many years. So, yeah, I mean, there will be opportunities for Turkey. But again, I don't think Central Asia or the Turkic world will be the main arena. Um, at the end of the day, it's the immediate neighborhood, especially in the Middle East, but also the Black Sea with Ukraine on, on the agenda and, and the Balkans. That's number one, I'd say. Number two, the Western Europe, because the EU remains the main economic and to a degree political partner for Turkey. And there will be also other regions, uh, one thing we didn't discuss, but I think it will be probably more important than Central Asia. Is Sub-Saharan Africa or parts of Sub-Saharan Africa? It's, it's, a, it's a long, it's it's a big place, right? Turkey has stuck its neck out in Somalia by providing military security, development, aid, and Turkey is much more welcome in, in those places than even in those Turkish-speaking countries. So I don't think Central Asia will be such an important uh, arena, but it. It will be there, no, no doubt. Because again, if you want to be a power beyond your region, you have to be present in more places. And Turkey does have the ambition. In your book, Turkey under Erdogan, you also described how the country has embarked on militaristic foreign policy, intervening in some regional flashpoints, such as Nagorno-Karabakh, um, which is in South uh, Caucasus, or in Northern Africa, for instance, Libya. What is your anticipation for Turkey's policy in these regional flashpoints that are in the direct vicinity of Europe. So we are already moving towards the southern and the eastern neighborhood of the European Union before we then touch upon on soon some critical, in my view, regions for, for the European Union. Do you think that Turkey will have more active role to play? You, you gave also other examples of Turkish involvement in Africa, but specifically, if we take a look at, you know, some of the geopolitical ambitions of, of Turkey, under Erdogan, will this... I think, I think Turkey will be much more present in the Southern Caucasus because Libya and Southern Caucasus are somewhat different in terms of proximity and the density of the linkages. There is a consensus across the main parties that Azerbaijan is as close you get to Turkey. Uh, so this brotherly relationship is very much ingrained into the thinking. And again, going back to domestic politics, Sinan Ogan, actually, this third candidate, He's of Azeri origin and actually a bit of trivia. He did his PhD in Gimo in, in Moscow. He's a Russian speaker as well. But be it as it may, Azerbaijan is a key partner on energy security with gas deliveries, on trade, on, on cultural links. And I must say also, Azerbaijan has its own influence over Turkey domestically because it's not a one-way street. Also, Azerbaijan influences. Turkey. 
after the victorious war of 2020, Turkey is much more embedded there. But I think one area to watch is how Turkey moves forward or not regarding normalization with Armenia. Because if there was something, a bright spot in this otherwise hopeless situation, because all the peace talks have gone to nothing, and now they have the blockade on the Lachin corridor linking Armenia to, to Karabakh. But Turkey and Armenia restarted normalization. And if now after the election where a new government or Erdogan for another term has much more wiggle room presses forward, that will be good news. Of course, Azerbaijan would rather have normalization linked to Karabakh, right? Ankara doesn't normalize until Karabakh is re reincorporated in a peaceful way into Azerbaijan sovereignty. But uh, and Armenia wants the opposite. It wants a two-track process where Yerevan Ankara remains a separate conversation altogether. I hope that uh, this normalization won't fall prey to the stalemate around Karabakh. And I also hope that Russia won't have that much of an opportunity to be a spoiler. Because if somebody wants to <laughs> cement the situation in Southern Caucasus, it is Russia. And Russia has gotten some mileage because now it has peacekeepers around Karabakh, which was not the case before 2020. But anyways, to draw the line, I mean, Turkey has a lot of skin in the game and it will be really involved be it for domestic or economic or geopolitical reasons and we're part of this dynamic in the region. Now Libya looks a bit different because the opposition was really critical of the intervention. They saw it as Erdogan's vanity project, except that actually it paid off. It stabilized the front, opened opportunity for national reconciliation, but now, three years later, it doesn't seem very hopeful. I mean, the division between East and West is still there. But Turkey is behind Tripoli because the, the person who runs the Tripoli government, Beba, is as close as you get to, to Ankara, to the Turks. So I think it will be more of the same. But the question for Turkey is how you, first of all, stabilize Libya, how you make sure that the Russian mercenaries, the Wagner Group, leaves, and also how you capitalize on your political uh, gains, especially on the side of oil. Because before Gaddafi was toppled, Turkey had billions in investment, which now is frozen and is blocked. And lots of private sector people in Turkey are asking about their money and their frozen assets in, in Libya. So, it will take some time before all those political or security achievements translate into some palpable gains. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the past three years, despite all those negotiations, processes, national unity, ideas, UN back talks, seems that Turkey is stuck right now in, in Libya, at least for someone like me who watches those things from a bit far. Now we're moving to Southeast Europe and here what we always hear as a question is whether there will be a kind of military tensions between Greece and Turkey. That is the one question I want you to answer, whether you see a kind of escalation in the political relationship or any kind of likelihood or risk for, let's say, more ambivalence in the relationship, but also in terms of how do you see Turkey being positioned in the Black Sea area? I mean, next to Ukraine and Russia, we have Romania, Bulgaria. That is obviously a very, very big question mark in terms of knowing how previous governments, for instance, the government in Bulgaria have been carefully navigating between these regional powers. What is your anticipation for the new Bulgarian government in this regard? And then we have, of course, the Western Balkan bloc. Do you see any kind of 
any kind of shift there. We've seen protests in Serbia. We we are seeing, of course, that regional powers have, you, I mean, you've written a book on the Russian leverage in Southeastern uh, Europe and specifically how Russia is actually able to, well, use some instruments uh, for influence. What is uh, What will be your take on Turkey's role specifically in this region, in this broader region? So these are many questions. Let's tackle them one by one to the best I can. I mean, first of all, in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean, things are looking up, actually. A few months before this month of elections, because, of course, Greece had its own election last Sunday. We're recording uh, on the 23rd, and on the 21st was the Greek elections. The expectation was that there will be a lot of tension for domestic reasons in between Greece and Turkey, that both Erdogan and Mitsotakis will be using the other to rally people behind the flag. But we haven't seen anything along those lines. It's really fortunate, really hopeful. No crisis manufactured in the Aegean. The Turkish drilling ship stayed in the Bay of Talia. And there's been calm, unexpectedly, which opens an opportunity for more constructive engagement, I hope or at least keeping tensions under the bay. But who knows? Those things are cyclical. They tend to re-emerge every now and then. And one thing to watch is Cyprus, which also has a new president, Mr. Christodoulidis. He now says that it's time to have another peace process with the EU taking a more active role. Even if that's not possible because the EU is not impartial in Cyprus, that's a more constructive atmosphere than just kind of flexing your muscles and dangling with your weaponry. And Turkey is not necessarily as powerful vis-a-vis Greece because Greece has also ramped up defense spending. There's the Greek-French partnership. Uh, and there's some red lines drawn by Greece and its allies as well. So I hope that we won't get into a situation we had in around 2019, 2020 between Greece and Turkey. And then this whole trend towards normalization. Again, we've seen that with UAE, with Saudis, with Israel, also with Egypt, I forgot to mention, will spread out also to Greece. Foreign Minister Dendias went to the earthquake region immediately after the tremor in February. So at least at the diplomatic level, there's some signs of rapprochement. On the Black Sea and Bulgaria in particular, look, I mean, I don't think there will ever be a Bulgarian government which will be picking fights with Turkey because Turkey is out there, it's a big neighbor. It's important on migration, but it's not only. I mean, consistently since the 90s, Turkey is one of the largest export markets for Bulgarians, for Bulgarian companies. And it's a balanced relationship, right? If the Western Balkans import from Turkey, but not so much, Bulgaria and Romania also export on a big scale. And there's Turkish investment in both countries. Now, there's another dimension to this relationship because of gas. And Botash and the Bulgarian gas utility company, Bulgargas, have a contract. And Bulgaria has access to LNG terminals, or the terminal on the Marmara Sea, but also potentially others on the Aegean. So on the economic and political front, things are moving forward. And I don't think any Bulgarian government will take a partisan position. So we work with Erdogan, but not work with the opposition or vice versa. And so I'm not really concerned. Another dimension is that, of course, there is a big Turkish party or party supported by Turks in Bulgaria. And historically, it has had a troubled relationship with Ankara. But now they are on the same page. They have have been aligned, which also injects a measure of stability. So I, I don't think Bulgaria will be a travel spot. Oh, that, that's been the case even in the 90s. I mean, in the 90s, Turkey was adults with all neighbors, without exception. Actually, with exception, the, the two exceptions were Georgia and Bulgaria. Even in the worst of times, this relationship was fairly functional. In the Western Balkans, Turkish foreign policy is a bit if not schizophrenic, let's call it Janos faced. On the one hand, Turkey positions itself as an alternative to the West, 
uses Islam, also Erdogan parades through the region as a leader who commands support, a bit like Putin in those places where Serbs live. But if you drill down a bit, you see another layer in Turkish foreign policy, which is much more conventional. Turkey supported the expansion of NATO to Montenegro and North Macedonia without any qualifications. A clear contrast with Sweden and Finland. It contributes troops to the EU mission in Bosnia and also to NATO, NATO's K4 in Kosovo. It invests in renewable energy, plays the southern gas corridor. So there are aspects of Turkish presence in the Balkans, which is much more in line with, with the West. And there are other elements that are challenging the West and give some ideas to, to people to put Turkey in the same basket, which of course irritates every, every diplomat and policy analyst in Turkey. No, no, we are not like Russia. And one thing to say, which is probably important to see you sit in Vienna, very often people tend to think of Turkey as an extra regional power. That's why China, Turkey and Russia, this is a triad. But Turkey is different from Russia and China, not because it's very liberal, pro-West or democratic, but because physically and historically it belongs to Southeast Europe. I mean, part of it is there, but also many, up to one third of the population hails from, from the region and still has this deep connection. So when Erdogan goes to Novi Pazar in Serbia, people who meet and greet him have relatives in Turkey. And that's not the case with China, definitely. It hasn't been the case with, with Russia, although now we have 100,000 Russians who moved to Serbia in Belgrade and Novi Sad. But I want to tell colleagues, Turkey is a Balkan country. I mean, it's a Middle Eastern country. It's a Caucasus country as well. But it has a very organic relationship to that part of Europe. And it's not what you might more easily call an extra regional power. So final question on my side, and that is, what do you think will the relationship between Turkey and the European Union deteriorate after the 28th of May, or will it improve? What is your prognosis? And a personal question, are you already planning the next book? Well, I think it will be more of the same, really. It's very transactional right now. We are long past, unfortunately, this era where you could foresee this transformation of you was supporting that you become more democratic, more governed by the rule of law and so on and so forth. Now it's all about overlap of interests. And there are some, obviously, on migration with now the migration deal being renewed or up for renewal next year. There is the energy piece, Turkey being involved in the southern gas corridor. Turkey will probably be more active on the green agenda. Now it has signed up to the Paris Climate Accords and there will be also pressure on adjusting to what's the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So there'll be elements of cooperation on various functional issues, but there won't be any strategic project to build those two together in a privileged partnership. We're not talking about membership negotiations. Let's put them aside as many people do. But Turkey wants to upgrade the customs union into services, into public procurement, but frankly, without any movement on human rights, I don't don't think anybody will endorse such a project. In Germany, which tends to be on the engagement side, Turkey has some clear red lines. France is not keen on Turkey. The other member states aren't either. And there's some goodwill now because of Ukraine, but not to the extent that there is a relaunched relationship. Maybe after Erdogan. I mean, of course, if the opposition had won, you could have argued that there is an opening. But now the best we can hope for is just to maintain the relationship. And on the good side is that there won't be a rupture. So it's difficult to disentangle those two because even in the worst of times, the populist regime, anti-Western rhetoric, what have you. I mean, there's business going on. There's FDI coming from the EU. EU will be now important for reconstruction as well. People from Turkey live in 
a number of EU member states. And they vote for that one very often. I mean, German takes votes for the left in Germany and then cast a vote for, for a conservative party in Turkey. But again, it's, it's an interdependent connection that is difficult to sever. My next book, I do want to write a book about this new geopolitical moment in Europe with Russia and Turkey trying to challenge the status quo in different ways, but also how states caught in the middle are adjusting. This is not a story that has been told. Think about Serbia, think about Caucasus, the three Caucasus republics, uh, even to an extent Hungary and Roman, how they're playing the big guys, even though you might think of themselves as countries on the receiving end of, of geopolitics. I think if you look at the day to day, you see how much agency they have, something I mentioned in respect to Central Asia as well. So that's eventually what I want to publish, and I'm sure we have a number of other conversations. So thank you for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are, and we very much appreciate you being with us for almost an hour. And of course, I wish you much luck with this quite quite exciting topic of the swing states in the geopolitical awakening of Europe. That is definitely a topic that we will cover once the book is out. So thank you and take care. Thank you.